But now I want to turn to what I have entitled, It Is Not a Laughing Matter. James wrote to Christians. In fact, we ought to keep in mind, as I've been emphasizing lately, that most of the New Testament are written to people who heard the gospel, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, the Lord adding them to the church. They knew what was right to become Christians, and they did it. But most of the New Testament is written to keep them faithful. And that ought to tell us something. James writes to Christians. What he has to say in that book is very important. And notice what he says in James chapter 4 and verse 9. James chapter 4 and 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now, what would make the Holy Spirit have James write that to Christians? Well, let's see if we can develop it. You'll see that in this verse, James contrasted two different attitudes or mindsets that all people have toward God. But especially, we're talking about the Lord's church here. One is a careless joy. And the other is sober humility. And James is teaching us the attitude that we are to have in our approach to God. When we worship God in a assembly like this, we're approaching God in worship. When Israel of old approached God in worship, they did it through the Levitical priesthood and the priest of the same according to the specifications of worship set out for them in the law of Moses. In the Lord's church, spiritually Israel, each Christian is a priest himself. And we, through our high priest, Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man, offer our worship, offer our service day by day, which is our reasonable worship to offer our bodies living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now in this sermon... I want us to consider five examples from the Old Testament and the New. And notice what all of them have in common regarding it's not a laughing matter. We're not to take something lightly when the Lord wants us to consider it with humility and soberly. Go back with me to the days of the patriarchs and Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai as they were first known. And we want to look at a passage of Scripture that will set out what we want. Genesis 18, verses 9 through 15. And it's to emphasize something that Sarah laughed at the promise of that she would bear a son. The scripture reads, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And she said, He said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door. You know, there's always somebody standing in the tent door listening, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now notice the therefore. In the light of the biological fact, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Now, notice Sarah's on the spot. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. But the fact was this. He said, no, but thou didst laugh. And we see also in here why she laughed. She was afraid. Well, her skepticism 
was understandable. Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in years. And she was past childbearing, verse 11. Now, you might have forgotten, but that earlier when Abraham was first told the promise of Sarah having a son, that he fell on his face and laughed too, Genesis chapter 17, verse 17. It's reasonable to assume that Sarah could, maybe, could have heard the promise from Abraham after that. But when we get to Genesis 18, Abraham and Sarah had two different reactions. Sarah laughed, Genesis 18, 20, at the promise. But Abraham didn't. So while Abraham's initial shock at the news turned into belief in God's promise, Sarah still reacted with laughter. And I think that indicates disbelief in the promise. This seems to be the reason why when she is confronted about her laughing, that she denied it. She was ashamed of her reaction, Genesis 18, 15. There's always the case that we, and remember, these things are written overall for the Lord's church to be faithful, that we can forget that God can see us through anything. Our job is to trust in what he says. Take him at his word and to keep doing what it says to the best of our ability, regardless of what's going on around us or even on us personally. So she should have taken that seriously and not have doubted God and actually laughed at it. Then there's the case of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's sons-in-law thought that he, that is Lot, was jesting about the city's destruction. And so we turn to this passage in Genesis 19, verses 12 through 14. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy daughters, sons and daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Get up, up, get out of this plain, and the Lord will destroy this city. And notice the next part. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Genesis 19, 12 through 14. We live in a world that mocks, makes light of God, His Christ, the Bible. In fact, a great many people of the more secular-minded bent, and atheism, infidelic people, make light of anything to do with any God or anything religious. But then you've got those who give lip service to God and Christ and the Bible and even salvation and sin. And yet when it comes right down to doing all things according to the authority of Jesus Christ, they do mock the plan of salvation. They mock at baptism. They mock the Lord's Supper being taken off of the worship assembly on every first day of the week. They mock at singing and singing only, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and worship to God. And they make a lot of such things. They rejoice in denominationalism and they mock and make light of and speak against that which is not denominational. Well, I want you to remember what previously happened at Lot's dwelling when these angels, if you please, came to him. And these sons-in-law no doubt knew about that. But despite what they had witnessed in their relationship with Lot's daughters, they were still unwilling to side with him. And they considered him to be jesting or joking. They just could not conceive of their place and the way they lived and their culture and their society being totally destroyed. So they laughed at it. Well, people do that, as I said. But we all know the end. If you know the Bible is the Word of God, 
and you trust it to tell you the truth of Sodom and Gomorrah and the city of the plains. But when we come to Israel, fleshly Israel, God's people of old, the tribes mock the thought of reinstituting the Passover. Now this comes at a time when they have kings. And we look at Second Chronicles 30, verse 1, verse 5, and verse 10. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover under the Lord God of Israel. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even unto Dan that they should come to keep the Passover under the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. They had not done it for a long time in such sort as it was written. And then verse 10. So the posts passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even to Zebulun. Now look at the response. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Well, by this time in the history of Israel, the observance of the Passover was simply neglecting. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 5 reads, They had not celebrated it in great numbers as it was prescribed. But nevertheless, did that change what the law of Moses said? Well, if you'll read Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 3, then you'll see that it was to be observed with regularity as is prescribed. The messengers from Hezekiah declared that this was to be done so that they could enjoy God's favor. Verse 9. Well, again, the law of Moses instructed them to observe the Passover. And there was a promise of God's blessings if they did. However, the majority rejected the invitation. Now let that sink in. The majority of God's people rejected the invitation. The Passover was to commemorate God passing over Israel down in Egypt when they were in bondage when he destroyed the firstborn of all of Egypt. And they were to put the blood of a blue ribbon lamb, we'd say, on the doorpost and the lintel. And God had said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Well, that's a shadow of the Lord's Supper to come, for John declared Christ to be the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And the Lord's Supper we observe is one of the five acts of worship on this first day of the week, commemorated the death of our Lord. It shows forth His death till He come again. We should not use out of that. In the bread, we remember His body, a body tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Thus, he could go to the cross and be offered a sacrifice on our behalf. The fruit of the vine represents the blood shed from that body, a body that knew no sin, shed for the remission of sins, shed to purchase the church. The very blood we contact when we believed in Christ, repented of our sins, confessed our faith in him, and then we've been buried with him in baptism, baptized into his death. There the blood's applied. All our sins are washed away. We're raised to walk a new creature in Christ. And the blood that covers us and the spiritual body of Christ where it flows is that same blood we contacted when we were baptized, 1 John 1, 7. Yet, Israel didn't see anything important about this. I remind you, these are not pagans. These are in a covenant relationship with God. I remind you, too, that we're not pagans. We're not of this present world. We are the church of the living God and members in particular, Christians of Christ, added to the church by the Lord himself upon our obedience to the gospel of Christ, which is God's power to save us, Romans 1, And yet, wherein, on the first day of the week, the supper with the other four acts of worship are ordained of Christ to be observed. My brethren, sometimes absent themselves because there's something else more important for them to do. I speak not of sick people, of course, but I speak of people who find it easy to not feel good and go do other things. 
but they still feel the same way on Sunday and they won't come simple with God. Figure that out. I preached all these years and it's been that way in every congregation. Again, what we're saying and what we're reading was written to either God's people of all of Old Testament or God's people in the church. Why is that the case? How can we expect heaven when such simple things and we have no hindrance, not a thing in the world hinders except ourselves. Well, you go then to Second Chronicles 36, 15 through 16, and the people mock the warning about the captivity. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Now watch. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Have things changed when it comes to faithful members of the church and the teaching of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, the Jews were God's people, Deuteronomy 7, 6, and Jerusalem was his city, Deuteronomy 12, 5, under the law of Moses. However, that did not mean that the people could not go into captivity and that the city could be destroyed. And the sequence of events that would lead to the captivity of God's people had already started. Second Chronicles 36, 5 through 7 and 9 through 10. But God is compassionate and loving. He does not want to see his people lost. But as free moral agents, he's not going to force us against our will to do his will. He reasons with us. He establishes the fact that he is God, our creator, the one who has the right to command and direct. And everything he does is for our good. The prophets of God would say to Israel of old, well, since you're not serving him, he must have gone back on his promises. That was designed to say, well, no. He's never gone back on any of his promises. So why is it you're not serving him? And the guilt had to fall where it had to fall, rightly so, on them. God in his compassion warned about the Babylonian coming. Second Chronicles 30, 15, And the Lord God of their father sent to them his messengers, rising up betimes and sending. And the reason... Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Yet they had already rejected God. And the reason why, moreover, all, of the, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 30 and verse 14. Well, what should we conclude from this? Well, they wouldn't listen, choosing instead to make fun of the prophets and war who warned them on God's behalf because he had compassion on them. But we move from that to the New Testament, how that the people laughed at Jesus for saying Jairus' daughter was only asleep. We read and. Luke 8, 41 through 42, and then we'll go over to 49 through 53. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age. And she lay a-dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Then 49, while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue house, saying to him, and by the way, I insert here what no parent ever wants to hear. Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not. She's not dead, but sleepeth. Now look at the response. 
And these are not bad people here. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. Now let me ask you something. What is the difference with Jesus and him saying she's asleep as to what he's going to do and him saying that she's dead? What is it to him? Do you have that kind of trust in Jesus Christ in all things? I remind you again, this is not said to ungodly people. This is not said to people who are not in covenant relationship. This is said to the people who had served God. This is said to three who were the closest friends Christ had among men on earth. They had witnessed all kinds of miracles that Jesus did. The condition of this man's daughter may have seemed hopeless. Luke 8, 42 says she was dying. But I say again, Jesus over and over again had performed every kind of miracle. Why is it it was so hard for them to say he could take care of that? You see that at the raising of Lazarus. Lord, if I'd been here, he wouldn't have died. You can almost see Jesus saying, I'm here and he's going to live anyway. I am the resurrection and the life. Aren't you so thankful to God that He has patience with us, and that He suffers long with us till we can understand and get some things through our thick heads? We started out right in obeying the gospel. We knew we ought to do it. If we knew anything at all like we ought to, Yet in the church, we evidence that when the trials and tribulations come upon us, sometimes our faith has not grown much more than it did at the time that we were baptized, and maybe it's even gotten more shallow. The mourners were present. But when Jesus is present, Mourning can be turned into rejoicing. Now think for a minute. They're mourning. They laugh Jesus to scorn. Jesus raised from the dead. And now what? Why are they rejoicing? Mourning. Laughing to scorn. And now rejoicing. What does that say about us? Our study of the Bible. Our prayers. I concerned about one another, where our minds are when we're worshiping God, singing, praying, Lord's Supper, studying, being ready unto every good work and being zealous of good works. Notice that everything in all of our examples that people laughed at came to pass. Notice that. Sarah had a son, Genesis 21, 1 through 3. Sodom was destroyed, Genesis 19, 23 through 25. The Passover was reinstituted, 2 Chronicles 30, 13 and 15. Jerusalem was conquered, 2 Chronicles 36, 17 through 21. And Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, Luke 8, 54 through 55. And yet, prior to these things, they laughed. When such was told them, that thus and so would be done. They seemed unbelievable before they happened, but they each occurred as God intended. All these examples were of people who lacked faith in God and His Word. But it shouldn't have been that way. In each of these examples, they did not believe what God revealed to them, either to embrace the promise, to heed the warning, or to obey the command. Each time God showed that He keeps His promises, He punishes those who are disobedient, and He rewards those who are faithful. Now we tie in another verse that we all know, and that I quote most often. 
Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You know, I just cannot in my mind picture the return of the Lord. Except that I can picture it in the words that God gives me. But can you actually see that? We were journeying on our recent trip, and I've done it so many times. You look out over that, and you see all these billowing clouds. You're up there with them, even above them. And you think of the promise of the Lord. You who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And the scripture says, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he'll come in the clouds. Every eye shall see him. What a thought that is. Can you really picture it, though? Do you ever try? Do you try to look at these billowing clouds and see the Lord in his radiant glory and that host with him and the whole world fading away? Why shouldn't we? The Bible teaches it. But say that to most people around about us, even some religious people, and you'll be laughed to scorn. You'll be ridiculed, and you'll be mocked. But listen, it's not going to change the truth of God's Word concerning what's right and wrong and His second coming. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're not a child of God today, oh, why not? He's going to punish those who are not obedient to the gospel in its eternal punishment and anguish and sorrow that no mortal mind can grasp. On the other hand, for those who are prepared when he comes, in glory and majesty, power and honor forevermore beyond the mortal mind to grasp too. So if you're outside of Christ, why not be baptized to Christ today, first believing in Him, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, have we laughed behind the tent flap at times at the promises of God? We shouldn't. But if we've sinned, we need to repent and confess it and pray God for forgiveness. Now we offer that invitation for you to act upon the truth that God will always keep. And will you do so while we stand and sing?